good evening sharad ji rajaram here just start that i'll say hi to you before yes, we start good evening. <laughs> good evening thank you thank you for accepting the invitation and we look oh, forward yes, to your uh, talk yeah it is my pleasure yeah. Yeah, uh, we will start now. A very happy evening to everyone uh, joining from India, and a happy morning to folks from US and Canada. Pleased to welcome you all to this Pin Chennai's big uh, video conference session with uh, Sharad Ji, Mr. Sharad Sahai Mathur, Group General Manager, Center for Railway Information Systems, New Delhi. on the topic information systems past present and future at the indian railways before the speaker gets to talk i have the pleasant duty of doing three things uh, introduce uh, spin chennai set the context for the session as well as introduce the speaker so uh, digital transformation we, we are talking about uh, digital transformation getting accelerated by by covid uh, but uh, we will be pleased to know that uh, india as a country uh, as uh, you know progressed as one of the leading uh, institutions across the world in terms of railways and particularly the railway reservation uh, has been a you know, fantastic uh, it system a role model for many of the business systems which have evolved from india a uh, very notable example so if you look at uh, uh, the uh, prior to 2020 digital transformation was there was a force of its own uh, maybe uh, more than half of all uh, gross domestic product worldwide uh, has become digital Uh, as uh, businesses have uh, started generating revenue from software applications and used uh, new technologies to build uh, proprietary solutions then the world was hit by the pandemic and uh, digital transformation itself was transformed right businesses uh, no longer view digital transformation solely as a source of innovation it has become a requirement for business continuity enabling teams to work anywhere and organizations to rapidly adjust in the face of the crisis whereas they typically used to move forward cautiously with the digital transformation but today companies are relying on it for the stability and agility it offers to their operations workforce and customers modern uh, technology solutions uh, you know are really central to this development there have been a spate of new technologies that have all given the convergence and have helped in uh, various ways on this uh, digital transformation uh, revolution that is happening organizations are converting data into meaningful value finding new ways to serve customers building solutions that are relevant for a rapidly changing socio economic environment they are also successfully reinventing for the digital economy so there was a survey done uh, greater than 83% believe that they need to embrace tech intensity to be the term tech intensity refers to applied use of a creative entrepreneurial mindset focus on inventing uh, new digital capabilities solve complex challenges for as well as government uh, advanced digital technologies so at spin chennai we have been working on a india centric digital transformation model dr ellen rajaram is uh, one of the core founding members is having the effort and uh, with uh, sarad ji also as a core think tank uh, member a part of the exercise so definitely our objective is to uh, create a india centric model uh, which will help Uh, not only MSMEs, uh, 
their institutions, but also the government in terms of um, uh, the digital path, the path to assess where they stand today and uh, with guidance in terms of uh, going, you know, improving themselves across the value chain and creating more impacts and a more productive, be more competitive with respect to the global economy and whatnot. And the benefits are inclusive, you know, inclusivity as a key benefit, sustainability as a benefit. We can go on and on in terms of talking about uh, so coming to Spin Chennai, a little short of, uh, uh, I would say, you know, 25 years old as a knowledge ecosystem uh, is, uh, is affiliated to CMU and the Software Engineering Institute of Carnegie Mellon, as well as ISACA, the global body. Our vision is to build a world-class knowledge ecosystem, which is very highly relevant and value-adding to the people, that is individuals, as well as the industry intuitively futuristic and completely co-creative. We have uh, 4,000 plus members, knowledge ecosystem, comprising of CXOs, senior leaders, SVPs, you know, VPs, HR, marketing, sales professionals, uh, CTOs, quality and delivery professionals, uh, banking, financial services, insurance, telecom, automotive, manufacturing industry folks, senior consultants, mentors, academia, and uh, several other institutions. Some of the international gurus who have been associated with Spin Chennai include uh, the famous Dr. Uh, Watt Samfri, who is hailed as the uh, quality guru in the world, in whose honor we, every year we do the Watt Samfri Awards, uh, the huge participation from uh, the who's who in the industry, including TCS, Infosys, Wipro, uh, almost you name it, everybody is there. They bring out the best case studies from the industry and uh, recognize the best. We have had uh, several other international gurus, including this figure from Israel, a theory of constraints expert, uh, Dr. Curtis, who has played a key role in the development of the world CMMI and people CMM model. Dr. Manu Ora, one of the top consultants, management consultants from the US, Mark Johnson management thought leader and co-founder of InnoSight, along with uh, Professor Clayton Christensen, Dr. Jeff Sutherland, co-founder of Scrum, Mr. Michael Krigsman, author of CXO Talk with more than 1,000 appearances, Mr. Barry Kriggs, ex-Microsoft CTO, Steve Beres, senior partner at Bain, Manuel Ariega of Google, YouTube, Mr. Lakshmi Shankar of Twitter, Dave, David Duncan of InnoSight, and uh, several other gurus have shared their expertise during 2020, 2021, apart from uh, leading lights from India. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting session. Uh, you know, uh, to Mr. Uh, Sharad Sahai Mathur, uh, you talk about out and out railway man. Right? People uh, will think, okay, he must have joined the railways and he could have spent the entire career at Indian Railways. Right? That is what the best people can guess. But if I tell you more than this, he studied his B degree also from Railways Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. <laughs> not many uh, you can find. Not even one you can find except uh, Mr. Mathur. Out and out railway man, very rare breed to find, uh, who did his B degree from Railways Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. And he has done uh, several management development programs from uh, Institute of IAM Ahmedabad, NITI, and then uh, MTech from Bits Pilani. And uh, I can go on and on. Uh, he's an IT specialist with the extensive experience of working in the railways logistics and manufacturing sector. He is skilled in the enterprise architecture, IT strategy, business process improvement, and IT in supply chain management. He has held very senior executive positions in Indian railways, including the CAO of Container Corporation of India, and he has been the GM, group GM, and 
uh, almost all the senior positions with uh, focused around technology. He has been the key man. Uh, coming to the today's topic, uh, you know, as I said, uh, the starting, uh, the railway system is uh, almost more than 50 years old. And uh, uh, we can boast of, you know, way back in uh, 80s, late 80s and uh, early 90s itself, Indian uh, Railways uh, Information System, and then uh, their Wagon Information System, uh, Indian Railways uh, and uh, Chris uh, was very famous. I remember uh, TC is uh, doing a project with uh, Chris on uh, Wagon Information System and all that. Uh, so I, I think to develop a system with uh, so many number of users, uh, with uh, so many variations, uh, with so many complexities, all right? Uh, and particularly, and making it uh, in, uh, having it in production uh, with uh, so many number of users uh, using it, a uh, phenomenon. Uh, at the point in time, in the early 90s, uh, no, no big IT company was there except uh, TCS. And uh, Infosys, Wipro, they were all very, uh, very, very small ones. Uh, even TCS at that time was doing majorly projects for US clients and uh, abroad clients, very little in the Indian context. Uh, so given that backdrop to have such a system with a fantastic architecture and catering to so many complexities, uh, giving desirable results, and in terms of performance, we are talking today about millions of users accessing a system and all that. But uh, this was happening way back in uh, 90 and developed within India. That is a phenomenal uh, thing. I think uh, today you know, we are going to listen to him uh, relive the history of uh, you know, what uh, they have gone through. It's going to be a very, very good learning. It uh, requires a whole lot of planning, a uh, whole lot of uh, strategy. And uh, you know, uh, we, we will all uh, wait to hear from him. Uh, which it may contain a whole lot of uh, you know, new insights that may give us in terms of uh, technology, architecture, governance, planning, uh, security, you know, and uh, whatnot. So without spending any more time, uh, those of you who have any questions during the session, please post it in the chat facility. We will take it up at the end. Uh, so at this point, I would like uh, to request all of you to unmute uh, for a minute and uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Mathur, uh, to this exercise. Is enough to be part of us for the next one and a half hours. Thank you, Mr. Mathur. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajanan. Uh, that was a very, very uh, nice introduction. Thank you very much. I have been part of the railway since 1982, actually, as Dr. Rajanan mentioned. I studied in the Indian Railways Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. I joined it in 1982. And I was quite lucky to see the transformation of information systems in the railways from the very beginning. So uh, that I was always, uh, for, from, from the beginning, I was interested in information systems. And it was slightly, as you know, it was a little underserved in the government. So I got the opportunity to associate with information systems in diverse areas in the railways. That was, uh, th that, that was very fortunate for me. And I really do uh, count myself lucky for being able to take a ringside view of information system as it developed across the railways and across the country. The, this, there have been so many changes and I'm sure that all the people who are here today, many of them have seen this transformation happening and what a transformation it has been and what a future we see in front of us, <laughs> both of them together. That is why I, I called this session today, um, information systems. Uh, I, I, if, you, if you allow me, I'll just share my screen now.
Shini, uh, I think we lost him, sir. Oh, okay. I, I think, you know, he accidentally... Yeah, closed his room, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we will uh, wait to, for him to get back. Uh, sorry, I, I dropped out by mistake. Just, just I, no, I would no, like no to share my screen. Share yeah. my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you'll have to enable me once more. Yeah, it's, it's done, sir. Right. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Yeah, in Zoom it happens. Ah, okay. Now I think you can see my screen. I'll just put it in full screen. Okay, right. So sorry for that little glitch, but it shows us that uh, technology uh, is unforgiving. <laughs> it happens. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay. So that, that is why I... I'm talking about, but I'm not going to talk about specific information systems, specific IT system, because we don't have enough time today for that. But I'd just like you to understand uh, how we went about it. Things, many things just happened. And uh, in retrospect, we can say that we did some things correctly, some things not so, not so well. And uh, now in the future, how, how we are planning to go about it. That is what I'd like to tell you. And I found that we have a compact enough group so that any questions, please put them in the chat box and uh, we can take them as we go along also. So, um, so this is uh, basically what I had. I have uh, only three points. One is the functions of Indian Railways. Second is the evolution of information systems in the railways. They have evolved naturally because the technology has evolved. And then uh, the third part where the future comes is our uh, vision of the enterprise architecture for the Indian railways, because that is basically where the future starts. We have a large number of systems today, but they need to be um, brought under a common architecture. And that is what our enterprise architecture project is all about. It is about developing, building a future for the Indian railways systems. Right. So, okay. So, um, so, so we'll take it from there. And um, now I am now in Chris, I am in the Center for Railway Information Systems. It is an autonomous body, which operates on a not-for-profit model. It was set up by the Ministry of Railways in, in 1986. So it was quite, uh, uh, I, I would say at that time, it was quite a visionary um, concept that you build a, a small organization within your larger organization, which concentrates only on the development of information systems. At that time, it was not even very clear that information systems would take such a leading role as they have today. It wasn't very certain how it would progress, but certainly at that time we knew that um, information systems would become quite uh, important as, as, as time passed, because uh, many could see that there was uh, information was becoming primary and processing that large volumes of information not possible through manual methods. And at that time, of course, it was in its infancy in, 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 in India, but other countries we could see were going down that path of adopting large scale automation of information. So that is how this CRIS was set up. And as, as you know, the mandate is to design, develop, implement, operate, maintain information systems for Indian railways. And now also architect a holistic vision and go along that vision for information systems in the Indian railways. So as you can see, um, all of us have been traveling by railways and uh, we 
all of us have uh, our uh, experiences and indian railways is of course quite a large system it is uh, amongst the largest ones in the world so the size is huge and it is not just that it is a large organization it is spread across a very large geographical area and that spread is accompanied by actual assets on the ground in the form of railway tracks in the form of our overhead uh, electrification equipment which goes all across the country so there is a geospatial angle also to the whole system it is not just enough that uh, it is not uh, like a, a, a business with offices in a number of cities it is actually physically geographically distributed there are large number of stations there are many passenger trains of course this is uh, these figures are from before the covid pandemic i have taken the figures of 2019 20 for that reason and freight trains the large number of freight trains you know passenger trains freight trains we do both and uh, as you can see roughly each passenger journey is around 150 uh, 140 kilometers is the average passenger journey but this is because there are many many suburban journeys which are less than 50 kilometers so uh, but still um, it is a large system on an average a freight consignment is carried for 6, 600 kilometers now all of this when we run train services we need a lot of infrastructure and the infrastructure is in uh, the form of fixed infrastructure that is the tracks and the overhead electrification equipment the signals and the locomotives the passenger coaches freight wagons so all of these are managed and maintained and therefore as you can see there are large numbers and that generates a large volume of uh, of uh, data and information similarly passengers there are so many originating passengers it is more than the population of the country actually but that is because there are about uh, 40 to 50 lakh passengers who travel daily in local trains in in mumbai and calcutta so that counts for a very large number of originating journeys all of those uh, journeys have tickets so they generate a large volume of traffic and originating freight also we have uh, a few years back we burst this 1000 million tons originating freight loading and now we have gone up to around 1200 billion tons so the whole system is quite large and the annual revenue is now exceeding 2 lakh crores and if you also add the capital expenditure that we do this is just the revenue that we get but if you add the capital ex expenditure that is now another 1 lakh 60000 1 lakh 70000 crores so the total figure is almost it is touching 4 lakh crores now is the amount of uh, money that is that is either expenditure or revenues that is being handled in by the railways in a year so whatever way you look at it the volumes are large as dr rajaram had said this is one thing that willy nilly we have had to specialize in in managing these large transactions so very quickly if you take a functional view of the railways now you'll see you can see here i've just put this so that uh, we can understand the 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 different activities that we take for example we operate trains and then we also load and unload freight and provide uh, you know we we manage the freight part of it Oh, sorry it, it, it seems to be a little huh. we manage the freight part then we manage passengers so we provide them tickets then we manage the people who are running the trains then we dispatch and control trains and then if you see here you um, then we maintain the rolling stock we track and trace uh, rolling stock we maintain fixed infrastructure we manage freight terminals we provide passenger amenities we manage passenger terminals and 
then we have uh, much more to do. We have rolling stock links. We overhaul the rolling stock. We design and manufacture our own rolling stock. We manage occupational health of our people. We manage capacities. We build new railway lines. That building also is done by railways. We manage claims and disputes. We prepare train schedules. We monitor traffic. And then we also have the materials, the finance and human resources to manage. So functionally, you will see that the railways is much larger than most of the other uh, facilities, most of the other organizations, because functionally, there are so many things. You manufacturing, large manufacturing enterprise, yes. Train operations, yes. Large maintenance, uh, MRO type of operations, yes, we do it. Huge human resources, training requirements, learning and development, yes. Materials, lot of material movement, warehousing, yes, we do it. Transportation, yes, of course. Managing lot of finance, um, managing large number of financial transactions, high value financial transactions, yes. One project of uh, with with a large suppose it's a section of track. It is it is a project of uh, twenty thousand crores. If we are making a, a freight corridor, a larger project that is recently we have we have two uh, project freight corridors more than a one lakh crore. So they are huge projects, huge um, operations that are being managed. So, and it's a very, very, it is a very diversified organization. It is fully um, vertically integrated in, in all senses of the world. So the functionality is very, very diverse and complex. But if we reduce this to the major functions, then we can actually reduce it to these major verticals. And if you see, you start with the passenger services and freight services. This is what we offer to our customers. Either they are passengers and they are traveling across the country or they are freight consigners, consignees, and they are moving across the, the country. Their consignments are moving across the country as well. And uh, then the, the passengers, of course, they are, they are, there's some things on the screen, which I don't know whether you can see. I hope you can't just try. Anyway, so, I hope the screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, very much visible, clear. Okay, I, I think I see some red stripes on this thing, which somehow I think uh, because this file is shared. So, but anyway, I think we can just live with those. So, uh, then now these passenger services and trade services are abstractions actually, and they are implemented through the passenger terminals and freight terminals. When we say passenger terminals, we mean stations and they're running. And freight terminals now mean uh, where we load and unload the freight. And freight loading and unloading now is getting quite complex. It just used to be uh, what we used to call a goods shed, where we used to carry the goods and just load it into a train. But now goods are becoming very diverse, as I said. There are containers, as you know, shipping containers. So shipping containers, we also have roll-on and roll-off services. Roll-on, roll-off means um, trucks being loaded directly onto railway, special railway wagons. And then the train moves with those trucks on board. And then at its destination, the trucks are rolled off. So apart from normal freight, which is uh, coal, or food grain that is either carried in bags, like food grain, cement, they are normally bagged. Coal is open and we carry a lot of coal, about 50% of the traffic that we carry right now is coal. So 
freight terminals themselves have become very complex now because the diverse sort of various different uh, types of traffic. Right. Okay. So, um, then we have, uh, then we have train operations. Now, train operations is a peculiar uh, set of fun functionalities because this is unique to railways. And it is quite information intensive. The reason is that if you have a car, if you are in a road vehicle and you come to a red light, then if you go past the red light, then there is a chance that you will have an accident. But if you are driving a train and you pass a red light, it is not a chance that you will have an accident. You will have an accident. The reason is that that red light is there. The signal is there to guide you completely through your journey. You will encounter a red light only when there is a train in front of you, which is so close that if you start braking that, that time, you cannot brake in time. That is what a red light indicates. So as soon as you sight the red light and you normally you are able to sight the red light at a distance that you can safely brake before you reach the red light. So the very fact that you are sighting a red light means that you have to stop. That means that there is very precise control which is required during the entire journey of the train. So information intensive operations are there in railways. Each track can only be shared by one train. So you have to keep a tab very, very accurate tag, tab on where your train is and how it is moving. For that, we have all these complex signaling systems. And then to manage the signaling systems, you need some uh, processes that now you would like to, you would like to automate. So that is how um, railways operations is different from others. It is not like running a set of, uh, I mean, it's not like running a bus line where you can, once the bus leaves the, your terminal, after that, it is the driver's lookout, how, how he ensures that he drives safely. Whereas here, the whole operation is part of a very large operations organization that has to make sure that each train is managed well. And naturally for that, we have fixed infrastructure. Fixed infrastructure, I mean the tracks, the signals, the electrification equipment, the station buildings, the control offices, so there are a lot of fixed infrastructure that is uh, part of the railways, the bridges. So, and the rolling stock that uh, runs on it, the rolling stock are the locomotives, the wagons, the passenger coaches, the train sets, the EMUs that are running on, on that track. All of it has to be actively managed. Right now, everything is being done by the Indian railways. Different departments are doing all of these activities. And then, as I said, at, at the lowest layer is the human resources. As you know, we have around 12 lakh employees. So, and since we have so many diverse operations, so many diverse functional areas, we have a diversity of skills. We have many, many skills that need to be managed and all the learnings, um, as, as you know, technology changes increasing and railways is a large engineering enterprise. So even the capability management, human capability management, capacity management part is a fairly complex operation. And then finance management, large amounts of uh, money are involved. And materials, again, very, very diverse and large variety of materials are procured not only for maintaining and managing the facilities that we have, but also to run and operate the trains. For example, we need a lot of fuel. We, are, we acquire a lot of power and uh, 
we just to keep uh, the system operational there are a lot of uh, materials that we need to um, run the system so it is fairly complex but this is how we have distilled all these uh, all the processes into verticals and they by and large mimic the organizational structure of the railways also naturally but there is a slight amount of uh, we have tried to ensure that we are able to simplify things to the extent that we can structure them as far as the processes are concerned so now we come to the the past so this is this is where we start the the this is where we started actually in 1967 i hope you, I, i hope you can see the screen it's not too too small or the print uh, is it visible yes sir it's visible yes it is okay fine so then here you can see that we started uh, as early as 1967 in 1967 we start we set up our edp centers and we opened edp centers electronic data processing centers and these were primarily for three three things one was the management of the um payroll which was the, the main uh, main function was payroll so payrolls for for groups of uh, people and slowly different uh, offices were taken up under the payroll workshops offices all of them were taken up under the payroll so primary function was payroll then inventory management inventory management was a batch process a monthly process in which each month the inventories were totted up and it was uh, the critical inventories were identified what is the material that is likely to be in short supply what is the material that is not covered by purchase orders for example and the third was uh, revenue uh, reconciliation revenue reconciliation is because you get revenue at different stations and then at that time all these transactions were cash transactions including many of the freight transactions were in cash so all that cash collecting from all these diverse locations it used to take up to 6 months and then you had to reconcile everything that what you had thought that you have collected have you actually collected that much that much revenue so all of that was uh, done in batches in the edp centers and slowly all the edp centers came up till 1970 and as i said we also produce we also manufacture our own locomotives and our own uh, coaches and a little bit of our wagons also but mainly uh, locomotives and coaches are all manufactured in in by indian railways and at that time up to the early 2000s 100% were manufactured by us so in those production units these uh, systems were set up also and they were all ibm 1401s by the way all of these systems were ibm 1401s ibm 1401s were actually front end processors to ibm 360 and ibm uh, the older systems of ibm uh, in the us but in india they were not preprocessors they were the main systems because this is all that the americans would give us so when they finally got here in around 1970 when they had a survey of the systems that were uh, installed in india and they came to indian railways they found that their cpu loading was up to 99% in our in our centers the reason was that we were using these things so intensively the highest level of usage of any ibm 1401 was in the indian railways they were quite surprised actually ibm they had been thinking that maybe we'd buy a system 360 we never did that we kept <laughs> we kept using their uh, 1401s up to the 80s we kept using those so so that is uh, as you can see up to 74 then in 1977 which again is quite exceptional because 1977 means this was more than 50 years back or 40 years back there was a, a report was made there was a committee set up and then they set out the road map for it systems for indian railways all functions that is quite uh, an amazing document if you read it now 
and then that set the pace for the PRS system. PRS, I mean, passenger reservation system, which was the the next innovation that came up. So, um, in 1978 itself, we started studying the the what the functionality for the PRS would be, and uh, then till 1985, the PRS system first functionality was uh, then. Three agencies were involved in it. One was uh, ECIL, one was CMC, and of course, Indian Railways. And ECIL made their own small system, uh, which was uh, based in Hyderabad. But the main system, which was called Impress at the time, was made by CMC. And that was in Fortran. So it was a Fortran system, which, which was launched in October 85 in uh, Delhi. And then it was extended to other uh, units. And then, of course, uh, PRS, the passenger reservation system, it continued up to 90, 97, really, in this form. This form was the impress system, which was that, that Fortran system. But the problem with the impress was that you it was host-based, and there were five hosts. And each of the hosts, you had to you had to uh, install separate terminals for each of these hosts. So you had in, in Delhi, you had terminals for the Chennai system. In Mumbai, you had terminals for the Chennai system and the Kolkata system and the Delhi system. And you had to move from one counter to the other. If you wanted to take a, get a reservation in trains that were residing on different systems. So if you had, if you were taking a, a train to from Delhi to Chennai and back, then you would first have to get a reservation from the Delhi system and then move to a counter of the Chennai system and then take a train from there, take a ticket from there. Then that was proving to be difficult. Naturally, it became very complex. So uh, this fully networked system, which was uh, named Concert, was then conceptualized. And that was taken up by Chris. So Chris had already been set up in 1986. And then this PRS concert system was taken up by Chris. It was a fully networked system. And these, all the, the actually there's a story behind the PRS also. When, when PRS was being developed, then IBM had already been pushed out of the country in 1977. And once they understood that this PRS system was coming, then they were very sure that the only systems, the only hardware that could handle the PRS system would be IBM. So they were waiting that IBM would be called back. But as it happened, IBM systems were very expensive. And we decided that we would go in for digital. And the first digital used to have these smaller systems, PDP 11s and PDP 7s. And then when they came up with the VAX, then amongst the first large applications that was run on VAX was uh, PRS. As you know, volumes had started to ramp up very quickly. And uh, there were doubts whether the VAX would be able to take those uh, volumes. But the VAX took the volumes. And the rest, of course, as you know, is history. And again, with concert, there was uh, another uh, opportunity. Again, we continued with the VAX. But this time, we used uh, what is known as uh, RTR. The, the, the operating system is VMS. On VMS, uh, they run a uh, uh, routing system, which they call RTR, which allows wide area distributed uh, network, uh, networked database, actually. It is not a, a database in the modern sense of the word, but it allows you to route transactions from one host to the other. And that RTR still continues to a certain extent, although now we have uh, started to change our platform over. But that was quite a revolutionary thing that allowed us to, at that time, take on such a large load. Because by that time, it had become very, very highly loaded, this system. And the VAXs uh, continue to take the load only because of these technology innovations that we do. In fact, uh, RTR at that time was launched for the first time by, by digital. And almost the first installation in any large system was in PRS. So in the meantime, um, 
this um, freight operations information system also was conceptualized. And as you can see in 1986, Chris was set up. Chris was set up only for that. Originally, it was set up only for the freight system. And then slowly it took over, as you know, the PRS and then all the other applications of railways. But the freight operations, again, at that time, uh, we were touching 200 million tons of traffic, freight traffic. And there was a thought that how will we go beyond 200 million tons without automating our operations. And that is how the freight uh, system, freight operations information system was conceptualized and started. In this, initially, the uh, approach that we took was we procured software directly from US. Uh, it was actually from Canada, but it was based on the US operations uh, system. And that was based on IBM mainframes. So we bought an IBM mainframe also. However, that initial system could not really get past the stage of testing. So then in 1997, there was a decision that we would dispense with that system completely. We struggled with, with it for almost uh, 10 years. But then it was decided that we dispense with that. And then CMC was taken on board. And along with CMC and Chris jointly, we developed this present version of the freight operation system. We're starting with a few modules and then expanding it. And uh, voice, of course, is now still expanding, taking care of the new functionalities that we need to implement. So it primarily two parts, the rake management system and the uh, um, terminal management system of voice. And they came on, came on steam by around 2006, the whole thing was implemented. 2002, the rake management system was implemented. In the meantime, there were unreserved tickets used to be just bought across the counter. They used to be um, what we call card tickets. And those card tickets also, they were computerized. This one was a very quick um, computerization because it was based from the beginning on RDBMS uh, systems. So it wasn't too difficult to implement. But we decided in April to, that we'd launch it on the 15th of August, 2002. And uh, 15th of August, 2002, we launched the unreserved ticketing system. The same day, 15th August, 2002, we also started e-ticketing, which was operated initially by IRCTC. Even now, IRCTC runs the system, but now the backend system is completely developed by, by Chris because it is uh, the, the web application. At the backend, of course, it integrates with the PRS. So it is interchanging data with the PRS system. But the front end initially was developed, got developed by RCTC from the private uh, sector companies. And then later in 2014, we took it over. Chris developed a new version. And that new version is now the one that is running, uh, which is IRCTC's application actually. It's actually, uh, it is run in Chris. Then alongside, there were other uh, computerization efforts at that time for our workshops, divisional offices. There was a MIS project that was started in 97, and then it continued for the next six years. And then slowly, that whole, the, the reason for having distributed applications, which was the unavailability of uh, data networks in the country, that slowly lessened data networks became much better. Now it is difficult for us to think how tight the bandwidth situation was at the turn of the century. And uh, at that time, it was very difficult to centralize applications. And the web also was not that, that much developed. So we had to distribute our servers also and then exchange information across those servers, which was a difficult thing. By the time we got that, uh, that right, it was time to shift over to centralized applications to which now we have started to move. So we are moving towards centralized applications now. So this was the situation by this, this graph shows you till 2009, because after that things became very complex. So this was the situation in 2009. 
Now I'll just go through this uh, thing a little. This this screen. By 2009, we were here. As I said, we had decided upon these verticals, passenger transport. If you see here, these are the verticals on the top of the screen: passenger transport, freight, rolling stock, fixed infrastructure, materials, human resources, finance. And then, if you see the y-axis, the y-axis shows interfaces at the bottom, and then transaction processing systems, monitoring and control, planning and analysis, and strategic systems. And the boxes showed different uh, IT applications that were being developed or had been thought of. And you can see that this whole canvas had become quite complex. At the bottom are the interfaces that we had thought that, that either we were already using interfaces with our customers or the interfaces that we had projected, we had forecast that we'd like, that we'd need to use in the next few years. In 2009, our, uh, this is where we were. And we realized that we have got a very large system on our hands. It is going to become unmanageable. After 2009, there was a period of expansion and then a period of integration. So the expansion period was when applications that had been running, but that had not spread to all the different locations were expanded. For example, freight operations information system was expanded. And we had a control, of, we have uh, these train control offices. So the train control offices were also computerized alongside. And those IT systems of the control office were linked to the freight operations system. Then for tickets, we moved to ticket vending machines for our unreserved uh, uh, ticketing systems. And then we got the materials management at that time was, uh, there, were not, no, there was no centralized system, for example. They were all different uh, small space systems that were running in all the zones and the divisions. So we centralized all of those and put them into a centralized materials management system that is now running, which we call integrated materials management system. So, and civil engineering assets and things that we are not looking at before were put into place. For rolling stock, we put into place uh, ERP systems. Some of them we, we tried to implement, then later on we had to change that strategy. And then web portals and web hosting became much more important. And then, then after 2015, the last five years, there's been a lot of integration amongst all these applications, because we, now information has to move across the applications and the users, whether they are railways or whether they are passengers, they expect that they'll be able to get information in, a, in an integrated fashion. You know, they'll be able to get information uh, from the same interface, from the same uh, UI. So, by, by the, almost by, by 2018 or 19, we had a very, very large portfolio of applications and you can all see them here. Ticketing and passenger services, we had a large number of applications from the core passenger reservation system to the, the NGET is the, is the web interface for that. And then unreserved ticketing and this and that. And, National train inquiry system and then handheld terminals for TTEs. We had taken that up as a separate project. So we had a large number of uh, systems there. Freight and operations, again, FOIS was the main one. Then there were other additions to uh, freight operations. For example, a, a, an application that would allow you to get a bird's eye view of how all your trains were moving inside the country and so that you could do some. Um, daily planning for moving those individual trains and all of these things got centralized because it became possible to centralize them and when you centralize them you can get a much better um, you can get a much better feel of the planning because what is happening is number of trains is increasing and uh, planning has to be much more precise so that you can run your trains efficiently planning for capacity of the railway line, planning for your crews, 
so that your train crew is available when required. What had begun to happen was uh, that because the number of trains had increased a lot, the crews were being given very unrealistic working conditions. They had to, they had to stay away from home for long stretches at a time. Sometimes they had to work more than eight hours at a time, and it is very strenuous work running a train. Sometimes they would get only for a day, they were at a remote station, but they got only two hours of running. And the whole system was uh, not conducive to their well being. So, when we put in this crew management system and slowly we expanded it to all the individual locations, we found that the crews, uh, scheduling of the crews became much better, availability of the crews became better, and of course, uh, their well being also improved. So, things like this train scheduling. Uh, again, used to be a, a skill. It used to be an art, actually, which was exercised by a few experts. And uh, that now is part of, a, of our what we call satsang, which is a software-aided train scheduling system. And slowly, all these uh, slots, all these uh, building blocks fell into place. And we started to the process of interchanging information amongst these applications. So same rolling stock also, rolling stock, rolling asset management, rolling stock, then fixed assets, all these fixed infrastructure, so managing all the fixed infrastructure, different type of applications, and then finance, materials and HR. So all of these uh, systems were brought and put into place. But the result was that they were a large number of systems, they still are, and they are on diverse platforms because they've come up slowly as the years have passed. So this is how this uh, are physically, this is what things are looking at, uh, looking like right now. I'll just uh, run you through this slide so that to give you an idea. Most of the applications are now centralized. They are in, in centralized in Chris, most of them. Although uh, a couple of them are now also in Railtel's data center. So they are with Railtel, they are being managed by Railtel, one or two of them. And this, of course, uh, through this secure network, they are interacting with their users through either the internet, increasingly internet, or we also have two trusted private networks. So which we run, which are based on these lines that we lease separately. They are for ticketing and for our freight operations. So freight operations, train control, they all run on one trusted private network and ticketing reserved, unreserved. These run on the, uh, what we call the unified ticketing network. So we have two of these. We still have some VSATs in remote locations uh, for primarily for freight, where we have coal loading at the at the pit pit heads of the coal mines. So coal mine pit heads, there's some of the their, their connectivity issues sit still, but they are getting better now. And access now is through increasingly through mobile devices, browsers, of course, and through the internet access of different types. Our trusted private networks, we are connecting still to some green screen terminals. You will have seen that our passenger reservation system still has got green screens in some of the locations. We are shifting over to, uh, um, to, to client server and uh, thin clients there, but still some green screen terminals you'll see. And then we have these kiosks. These are these, uh, automatic ticket vending machines. We have now mobile devices, thin clients. Now, of course, you can, since you can buy your tickets over the internet, so you are able to directly connect through the internet also. But these are for the, the private networks connectivity is for our own internal users. So they are also now connecting through a variety of devices. Then we also have some distributed servers, for example, PRS, still continues to be a distributed system 
we have four servers. We used to have more. We have reduced that to four. But we have four sets of servers, one in uh, Delhi, then Mumbai, Kolkata, and Chennai. So we have four sets of servers. And we have this remote DR uh, center in Sikandrabad, where, for example, uh, in, in, in uh, Kolkata, about, uh, more than, about a year back, there was a fire in one of the buildings there. And that building coincidentally also housed our PRS system. So that PRS system had to be turned off, not because there was some fire damage there, but because the upper floors had caught fire. So the fire department shut off the power until they could do their investigation. So at that time, we were able to move our PRS uh, system. We were able to seamlessly migrate it to the DR in Sikandrabad. And for four or five days, we ran it from Sikandrabad. Then we were able to replicate the data back to, to Calcutta and start it up. And the disruption was not noticed. Not, not, not uh, people didn't get to know. Otherwise, had we not been able to do that, moving to our DR site, it may have uh, disrupted operations a little. So this is how the system looks like right now. One thing that we had not been looking at for so long was that we had been looking at data as an adjunct to the applications. So an IT application, a software that we had made would be accessing the data. And we never looked at data as a separate layer. But when we started to take uh, an architectural view of our systems, we realized that data is sort of, it dances to its own tune. So it has to be first uh, identified. It has to be mapped to real world entities. And then the attributes have to be managed. So once we started that activity, we got uh, to the concept of data hubs. We are still working on that. And as you can see, there are a number of, uh, very large number of uh, data hubs in which the data has to be defined and the definitions have to be standardized so that the mapping of the real processes and the objects that are associated with each process is more realistic than it is right now. And we have found that that is the basis of getting correct results from your analytic systems. Actually, this has become more accentuated, more pronounced ever since we have started to analyze the data that we have. Then we find that unless the relationships amongst the data um, elements is properly defined, there are going to be problems with your analysis. So data analysis suffers if your data management is not up to the mark. Your data governance has to be up to the mark. So that is one very important learning that we have now, the data governance part. So as I said, as we move into the future, we have realized the, the importance of having a very strong data governance system in place. As I said, um, increasingly there are cross-functional processes that increasingly are being managed by IT systems. Um, excuse me. So, um, so, so this is uh, just uh, so something that shows that now a process, now increasingly processes are cutting across organizational boundaries. They are cutting across departmental boundaries in the organization. And the expectation is that previously people would not uh, mind if their payments were uh, made after a couple of months. That was the norm. But now uh, vendors have are, are much more uh, clued in and uh, their, their whole process is much more uh, streamlined. So we, the payments 
to to vendors even large payments have to go within a matter of days and they have to go directly into bank accounts and things like that so there is a lot of cross functional uh, processes that have to be mapped to our it systems for example if you see this uh, the example that is the second example that is when a work is sanctioned if a work uh, a work is a project as a project is done some engineering uh, project is executed then it sanction the placement of its work order the measurement of the progress of the system and then the bills are linked to the progress of that particular project and then payment is also made directly to the contractor's bank and that whole thing is moving seamlessly without any manual intervention so that that is the, the reason where why we realize that if we continue with this ad hoc development then we will uh, end up with we may have individual systems which are the best but we'll end up with a combined system that is not uh, the, the best that we can have and that is how this enterprise architecture effort uh, was started by us so these are some of the priorities now what what we are doing is we are taking a a customer centric view so these are some of the the priorities that start with a customer centric view this is what now the organization itself is doing i mean it is part of the government's policy now that whatever you do has to be uh, customer centric and our customers are passengers and freight customers and giving them a better experience building up the freight market share which is in the benefit benefits the nation in the in the in the benefit of the overall nation is that we move more traffic by rail as far as we can because it is a cheaper and more efficient uh, method of moving traffic and then the last mile should be taken up by other modes of transport and this whole thing should be seamless and uh, that that will increase the efficiency of your logistics across the country and it will reduce the costs and it will reduce the cost of your exports it will also reduce the cost of uh, of uh, material within the country it will reduce the cost of consumer goods so increasing the freight market share by indian railways is beneficial in that direction so that is one and that is how we are working with partner organizations also because that national logistics ecosystem has to be created and that means that the information that we have in our systems apart from uh, moving within the organization also has to move across organizational boundaries to um, our other partners like container train operators like um, container freight station operators third party transportation uh, managers shipping lines so we have many partners with whom we have to interchange information that also is something that we have now planned in and we have started moving in that direction then a lot of optimization is possible now so optimization of train operations and therefore managing our assets better lot of iot is possible now so iot and sensor based uh, diagnostics that is something that is coming up in a big way with its shift because large volumes of data are then captured by these diagnostic equipment and large uh, volumes of data has to be moved across the network and of course by better financial control and uh, as i said upgrading skills of the employees is another very important area so ma making a learning and development system that is able to um, leverage the technologies that we have now that is also part of the whole system that uh, we need to put into place so this is how we now look at it is that whenever we offer services it depends on the customers demand demands and uh, the organizational capabilities that we have and then only we can offer services and the services are technology led 
so it is a transformation of the of the organization that is a technology led transformation so you have existing systems and you have a future vision you have demands from your customers and you have new technologies available so considering all of this you have to see where you need new capabilities to be built up you build up those capabilities and then we able to provide technology enabled services new services and that is the direction that our set of uh, our our entire information ecosystem has to move to and that is the objective of our move to the future which is the enterprise architecture that we are developing now and as uh, i had mentioned the last time also is that the business application data and technology all three layers have to be looked at independently and since they are related to each other then those relations also have to be those connections have to be understood data is uh, as i said has, is emerging as the area that is that requires the largest effort because applications business processes something that you study but data independently we have not been studying so and then increasingly the security of the systems it security integration of all the components how do you measure the effectiveness how do you govern this whole system this these are the eight elements and these are defined in the india enterprise architecture framework with which we are working we are we are working as per the in india enterprise architecture framework okay so um how much time do i have now yeah another 5 uh, to 7 minutes okay so now now i'll i'll wind up i think uh basic idea is is given now i'll just move fast and then we take questions because questions i think i would like to have more questions and i can uh, give you a better idea of what we are doing so currently uh, we have business processes applications data right now it is more a discrete set of uh, it systems that is running data is based on the database linked to each application technology of course has come up differently as as each application has come up technology has got linked to that particular application we find it naturally difficult to move out of one technology stack and uh, security we have started some initiatives we have taken iso 27001 certification for our Uh, data center we have been able to manage it the reason is that now security is very very important you can't neglect it but naturally uh, we need an integrated security posture so to say so uh, that is uh, definitely on our road map and integration also as as i said that we have started on that path but planning uh, some uh, implementations yes ai ml implementations in chris yes we have started on that path uh recently we have a couple of use cases for example uh the recent one is uh the, on how we should uh, structure the for example one recent very interesting one is that how are trains moving and whether they are uh, they, they are their movement is getting affected by um level crossings or unmanned level crossings because sometimes there are interruptions at unmanned level crossings or level crossing gates not being closed so that interlocks uh, are are not allowing trains to move so are there delays on that account so that shows you where you need a road overbridge or a road underbridge so that is one use case that we have recently we have run so we have we have started using ai and that is where as i said the reason we found that the quality of the data is so important so we are using uh, we have started we have an ai ml we have actually an analytics group that is doing this job and we are expanding that group also so target state again a much more integrated system data science actually um, we are uh, we we have realized that is uh, very important and 
but it is a very specific area of knowledge. So we are looking at how we can create those data science groups within the railways who will then be able to get uh, analytics practice, practical analytics practice, which will work across the organization. So that is something we will discuss it during the Q&A also. So our uh, enterprise architecture project, of course, is, uh, as, as you know, we call it Vistar. Vistar and Vistar has these components actually. So a set of blueprints describing the current and target architecture. Actually, it's very important that we understand the target architecture. That is where we want to go. We, we have a horizon of five years. So after five years, what is our expectation? What will our customers want? What will the customers not want? Based on that, what are the IT systems that we'll require? And then we have a roadmap with the transition states based on the gaps. And we, uh, what we have realized is that it is not enough to say that we have to move from point A to point B. We have to say that when we want to move to point B, what are the skills that we'll require? So that skills upgrade also has to be factored into that roadmap. So your roadmap has to have, okay, fine. Not only will we move from point A to point B, but this is the capabilities that we'll have to develop, develop in our workforce. So for that, what do we need to do? To develop skills in the workforce, also you need IT. For that IT, what is the skill upgrade that you need of your IT workforce? So that entire thing, unless you do, you will not be able to move to the next level. So skills upgrade is very important. And principles and rules are very important so that you can then follow those rules. You can create rules and follow those rules so that you have a consistent uh, movement towards the, the target IT system. And then set of enabling technologies and governance. Governance, uh, we are hoping to have a comprehensive governance system in place so that what we do today is not lost. There is a continuity that is built into the organization by having a set of people who are who are mandated to look after the IT, the EA implementation, and also to make sure that the EA remains responsive to coming needs of the organization. It is not just a static uh, thing. So to create an enabling uh, environment, we have uh, put in an application portfolio management system, which we call Paridrishya, and an API gateway, which is actually one of the very important uh, parts of the system of a unified uh, system uh, of railways. This is called, which we call Prava, and which we have just started publishing APIs through this. So you will have seen that now Umang was one of the Ministry of IT's uh, applications. And Umang was linking at the back end to different uh, departments. And now Umang also has some railway information coming in. And that is all coming through our API gateway, through Prava. Some of the use cases that we have uh, that that we have uh, discovered recently are these end-to-end -end logistics, the one one area that we'll be moving. So as you can see, consigners they they they, they book their uh, wagons and they book their rakes. Actually, rakes are trains, full train loads, which is what we do. So they give a forwarding note and then they are able to load their consignments. And then they have interfaces. These, this system in the middle is the IT system that we have now, which is cobbled up right now, but which needs to be uh, integrated much better. And it has now links to not only the banks, but the GST also. And then these links that are API based links to the consigner and the consignee. These are the ones that we are now putting into place so that there's no manual intervention in this whole process. The whole process is, is IT based and minimal manual intervention, you still have information, the relevant information moving across. Same with rolling stock management. Rolling stock, this is now purely internal thing, except for third party rolling stock vendors, you can see the bottom left corner. But here also the information now is beginning to move and the, the, the target architecture is that it will move automatically through this entire 
uh, this, this entire set of uh, processes. As you can see here, another view of the rolling stock vertical. We realized that one very important uh, thing that we have to do is to look at different life cycles of mainly assets, life cycle of assets, life cycle of data that we store, different uh, life cycles of our processes. For example, if we look at the life cycle of a passenger journey, so the passenger journey starts when the passenger starts thinking about moving from point A to point B. Will he use train? Will he go by air? Will he use road transport? That is the time when that entire journey starts, when the life cycle starts. If you have an effective publicity uh, system in place, then he'll at least know what are the services that are open to him. He'll know where to go to search out the schedules that are open to him. And from there, ticketing, finding out when his train is going to reach the station, is it late, how late it is, reaching the station, at the station being able to see where his train is, how he should move to that particular platform, on the platform, where his coach is going to come. When he gets on the coach, being able to check in and then being able to locate the train as it moves across, once it moves from the station, where is he? He should be able to see it on a, on a screen in the station or on his mobile phone or whichever way. And when he reaches his destination, then he should be able to, to understand where he has to move out of the station for his, uh, at the destination uh, city, wherever he is going, how does he move in the, inside the station to reach that particular gate? And all this information has to be moving, this consistent information coming to his mobile phone, to the display devices that are there in the station, to his mobile or, or, or to, to his uh, uh, PC, to his laptop. All of them have to be consistent. So consistency, so that entire unified information has to be provided to that passenger. In the same way for freight also, consistent information has to be provided across multifarious means of uh, accessing the information. And similarly, internally to the organization also. So if you look at the life cycle of one of your locomotives, it is a 35 year life cycle. But across that 35 year life cycle, information consistency must be maintained and it should be from a centralized source, logically centralized, so that you get the same information as you maintain and manage the locomotive. So locomotives, coaches, wagons, all of them, we look at, we have started to look at the life cycle. Another very important area that is coming up is costing. Now, with the advent of all these IT systems in place, different types of information that we have all stored in our databases, then we have the opportunity to do much more granular costing and then use that costing database to develop further passenger services, look at different freight services, look at the feasibility of projects for budgets, third party leasing, all these kind of non-fair revenues, if you can cost what you are doing accurately, then it is uh, much easier to get a more accurate view of all these uh, things that, that you can do and make your operations much more efficient and uh, passenger friendly, customer friendly. This is uh, again uh, an overview of what we are doing right now. This is a transition architecture actually. So how this works, if you just see the, the bottom, at the bottom, you can see it starts with the central data center and the, the servers and the hyper-converged infrastructure and all that we have. Moving towards the cloud, we haven't moved to the cloud yet, but moving towards the cloud. And then um, the logical data model, the data dictionary, and the, the master data, we, we, have, we have a master data management system also that is coming up. So the data layer, and then on top of the data layer, we have these uh, applications, the application layers here. And different applications are moving 
through this integration layer and then to these common gateways portals and i've encircled the api gateway because it is becoming one of the most important parts of our it uh, system because it allows us to uh, interoperate and it allows us to, uh, to to interchange data with our partners automatically without having to go through any manual intervention so for that the, the security is very important so perimeter security and security zones that is uh, something that we have uh, implemented and then we go through trusted private networks or the internet and then various devices through which different customers can access the different users can access the information and on the right top is this new uh, area that has come up which is the embedded embedded uh, devices as i said a lot of iot related uh, work is now um, coming up in the future we can see that a lot of embedded devices will come in as soon as they come in then this whole issue of edge data centers and then managing large volumes of data will become accentuated they have just started to come in and we can see that in future that will become one of the major types of traffic that is coming into our system here and um, as far as security is concerned we are getting all our, our, our feeds are also going to cert in to ensure that there is no internet related internet attacks coming on our systems and another new area is the social media and the unstructured data that is coming through social media and that also to be analyzed through this analytics and ai system this uh, practice that we are putting in place now so so going through this we hope that we'll reach a planned um, platform, IT platform for the Indian railways. So this was basically the, this is basically what I wanted to take you through. Now questions, if there are any questions, then uh, I'd like to answer them. A fantastic uh, presentation. Very, very uh, interesting to understand how we've gone through this journey of uh, three levels. Uh, so one of the things that came up, which you already answered is AML. You said that you are in the initial stages. How about uh, data science and uh, the elements? Cloud, yes. also, you said you are just exploring. Yes, actually, what we have realized is that uh, see the information that uh, the users need right now there are two types of users external users of course uh, external to the organization we are uh, approaching that basically by uh, interchanging information with them as per their requirement so for that we are trying to standardize the uh, information that we publish on our api gateway so that is the approach there but internally for planning purposes there is an increasing need to analyze the data and then that requires the use of AI ML also. So there, uh, unless you have a very broad based, uh, um, you know, a, a broad based look at what you want, it becomes difficult to uh, give people what they want. I mean, the, the users have to be involved uh, to, to, to be able to take this uh, information. So we are trying to broad base that a little broad base our ai ml practice broad base the analytics practice a little by involving users also so so that is what but yes it is going to come up the data, the data science part is uh, going to come up in a big way and very quickly because there is a need again it has thrown into uh, focus the need for data governance and uh, that is another thing because unless your data is accurate even if the algorithms are right you will not get the correct result. So that is the biggest thing. Then I, I thought I'll just take up some of these questions here. There is one about uh, help from overseas consultants um, from Europe or China. Well, what we have done is um, 
Um, we have been in touch with, for example, Deutsche Bahn. We have had a partnership uh, in the past. So we have seen what, what, what they are using. And uh, also some of the US railroads for freight, we have uh, looked at their uh, information systems. But again, Indian Railways is, uh, is different also from these other railway systems. So there's not, nothing that we can sort of lift and shift and use here. But definitely, we try to exchange as much information with other railways as we can. But there are very few vertically integrated railways now in the, in the world left. Only China railways, China railways is not very forthcoming with information. So it is difficult to get much out of them. So, yes, put it in speaker mode. Uh, Mr. Mathur, I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, I am sure that you must be having a lot of apps for your uh, organization's use. Um, you know, there should be an app for a TTE, app for uh, customers, app for uh, freight forwarding. A lot of apps should be in use. I was looking for some information on how many apps are in use. Could you just uh, let us know? Um, yes, I mean, apps are coming up now because now we have, we have realized that apps are probably the most convenient interface that is uh, in use. So we have apps for users, of course, for, for our passengers, we have an, an app that is uh, that covers various parts of the passenger requirements, information requirements of a passenger. For example, there's an NTES app, National Train Inquiry System, that tells you where the trains are, how they are running. Uh, we have recently uh, given an app to our, to, for some of the trains we've started that, to our TTs, the traveling ticket uh, examiners. Yeah. Now they have an app through which they can uh, look at, uh, they, they can understand which berths are vacant, then they can book people on those berths uh, yeah. through that app. We were actually constrained uh, by the fact that it was very difficult on a moving train to get the kind of connectivity that would that, that uh, would allow us to do these things. But now connectivity is improving. So, and the, the technology behind the apps also is improving, store and forward has become much easier. So uh, yeah. now we have started to put in apps. I, I was also looking for some information on your communication system, uh, Railtel kind of thing. So I just wanted to know how is your, uh, uh, no, are you managing communication system or is it a separate entity? See, communication, what we do is that we manage only the, the basics of the network, but otherwise we take a lot of our communication from, from Railtel also, because the backbone that we use is mainly Railtels. And uh, we have, wherever we have our own private network, we are using Railtels uh, lease lines. We have uh, diversity. So it is Railtel plus one more operator generally, but uh, Railtel normally is there with us. So the network is basically uh, being managed by Railtel. But we have our own NOC where up to the first level of the network, we are uh, looking at the status of the channels and the devices so that we can tell our service providers when there is a failure. Uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, one like, can I interrupt here, please? Uh, uh, I think uh, we, we until others can also get a chance. So I just want to check with uh, Sharadji, uh, what percentage of your development gets uh, in-house and what uh, I will, do you outsource, if at all, do you outsource? And also, if what is the total strength of the people you have who are involved in the development work? Huh, right now, of course, uh, we, it has been uh, happening in phases. Our model actually is that we get the development done from uh, external agencies as and when required. And, but we do take over the operation and maintenance of the applications. That is, that has been our philosophy that operations and maintenance should be with us because operations and maintenance, you know, that strategic control should be with us in some form. The uh, maintenance of the hardware, of course, is outsourced in the normal way, but uh, but increasingly, we have found that in some cases, it is difficult to uh, outsource uh, software development because now the requirements are coming in 
small uh, increments and possibilities now of uh, you know uh, creating software in small increments is also there because you can create small services and you can uh, implement them so uh, right now there are no large development uh, efforts being done by uh, external outsourced uh, i mean external parties but in the past, we have used CMC, TCS, uh, Capgemini, LNT, you name it. They have all, yeah. they've all been our, uh, you know, service providers at some point or the other. Okay. So it is, it is completely. It just depends on what works. Sure. But we are open to it. But and uh, what is your strength now? How many people are uh, uh, the relevant people, the development technical people? We have about eight hundred people now. Wow. Uh, okay. Our, our technical people. Recently, we have been taking on board more people. Okay. But my estimate is that actually railways needs a core of about 4,500, 5,000. Exactly. I was thinking so. Yes. yes. Because uh, this is a very small uh, number. Absolutely. And once our architecture is in place, then I expect that uh, there will be a you know sudden uh, yes. acceleration of the development. And then yes. we'll have to take in parties from outside and we'll have to do. What we are trying to do is to build up a very robust uh, practice of outsourcing IT requirements. That itself yep. is a bit difficult in public procurement. Absolutely. But yep. we are uh, trying to build that up also. So that insight also will be very useful as to how you actually govern this outsourcing and uh, monitor performance and uh, how do you reward uh, good performance and so on? So that, but that we can discuss at some later time. I suppose. Oh yes, <laughs> that, thank that's you. A big thing. That is an issue that has to. Yeah, be. thank you. Uh, I will leave the floor to other people to question. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, there is a question on IRCTC versus right. Chris. What is the scope and? Uh, okay. So right now, what IRCTC is doing, some of the, see, IRCTC is managing the uh, ticketing, really the reserve ticketing, actually, not the unreserved tickets are not managed by them. They have, of course, the tourism and all those other departments they have, tourism and the rail needs and all that. But as far as ticketing is concerned, the reserve ticketing, the uh, web ticketing is what they handle. Um, the, the front end of that web ticketing system is what they handle. So, as I said, up to 2014, even that web application was, uh, had been, they had got it developed and they were managing it. But in 2014, we had to re-architect the whole thing because uh, you remember that around 2014, there was, it had really slowed down. It was not able to take care of the load. Suddenly, we had a surge of transactions on the online system and naturally, this old uh, system that they had developed was not able to take that load. So uh, then they requested, and of course, uh, it was our mandate also. So we stepped in and took over that particular the web application. We actually rewrote the whole thing. And uh, because of that, once, because new technologies had come in, in, in memory, data grids, and all we could use. So now the capacity of that front end has gone up. But still, some things like they also have the air ticketing and this and that, that they manage themselves. So they have a data center where they host all those things, you know, air ticketing and something to do with tourism, their, their tourism website and all that. But the rail ticketing is now completely being managed by Chris. The front end is being managed for, I mean, is run by us for IRCTC. They give us the money. And the backend system, the PRS, is of course run for the railways and we get money from the railways. We are running on a no profit basis. We are a society. So it is on a cost basis completely. Whatever cost we incur, we ask the railways to give it to us. Our railways or IRCTC also, we have the same arrangement. Interesting. Are there any more questions? Or uh, we have one more question. Uh, this is on the uh, customer centricity. Uh, so, what has been see, one, one of the other, one of your uh, important initiative for innovation uh, has been to reduce time taken by customer to book ticket because that is a, a common interaction. So, what has been the improvement and uh, uh, what is what is your next goal from a customer centricity perspective? Um, well, the idea basically is uh, that 
you know, uh, we should be able to give the customer as much information as we can so that when he is buying the ticket, you, you know, he has as much information as, as he can, uh, as he needs to buy that ticket. You know, he should understand. Recently, you'll have seen even there were other sites which were doing it, but now even we have started to predict, give him, a, uh, the customer, him or her, a prediction of how likely his like, ticket is to be, uh, is going to be confirmed. So idea is that he gets uh, as much information in advance so that it doesn't take him much time to, he doesn't have to be uh, you know, run from one side to the other to get hold of, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to actually book a ticket. I mean, if he wants to book a ticket, he should be able to do it in one, one screen, do it as quickly as possible, get all the alternatives in one screen. So we have put in these journey planners. Then we have also now looking at uh, journey planners which take care of gaps for example uh, uh, the classic example is if you want to go to jnk to 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 Srinagar, then there's a gap in the middle because right now the, the railway line stops at katra and then from katra you have to till banihal there is a road bridge so having a combined uh, journey for that being able to plan that journey those kind of initiatives we have taken improving the interface and then, of course, speeding up the website as, as much as we can so that people don't have to wait for it. Those are the initiatives that we have taken right now. But the larger initiative is, you know, having these combined uh, ticketing systems across uh, modes of travel, you know, multimodal uh, ticketing systems. All those initiatives are across ministries which are coming up. So I think in the next one or two years, we can see those coming up. They will be game changers, really. And also, right now, we have some of these uh, Make My Trips and all on board with us. But that we intend to broad base much more. So once the policy is fixed for that, then a lot of these other players will come in to the what we call the travel ecosystem. And we'll be linking to them. Dr. Rajaram, I have only one question now. Uh, sure. Mr. Mathur, uh, we had these unmanned railway gates. And uh, in rem right. remote locations, you know, they used to be uh, unmanned railway gates. And uh, I think uh, over last year or year before, uh, that was kind of put to an end saying there won't be any more unmanned railway gates. I, I don't know what is the status. And secondly, when you're talking about rolling stock, how do you manage rolling stock with remote locations? You know, there must be number of locations which are inaccessible to you. So how does, uh, you know, the system take care of these? Okay. So unmanned railway crossings, of course, uh, the the policy of the railways now is to just eliminate the unmanned railway crossings. So unmanned railway crossings, the problem is that there are some formal ones, there are some informal ones. So first, all the formal ones, I think by and large, they've been eliminated. So either they've been manned or road over bridges, under bridges have been made. So the idea is that as few uh, grade crossings, you know, at grade crossings, uh, as possible, we should have. But uh, that it is an ongoing exercise because uh, there are some informal ones. So informal ones also you have to you have to stop and you have to create some way of people to cross over the track. You can't just fence it and then expect that the person will not cross because he needs some way to cross. So at least a little bit uh, down the line, he should have some sort of a method to cross it, either foot over bridge or increasingly these underpasses that we are creating. There. You must have seen, um, you know, within uh, one day, an underpass has been created by using these prefab concrete structures and all that. So uh, that is it, hopefully. And now increasingly, some of the lines are being made on viaducts. So wherever there is, uh, there, there is uh, um, where there are people living and uh, there, you know, where, where there are uh, built up areas, there, uh, the railway lines are being built on viaducts so that people can freely pass through. Animals can freely pass through also. So all those things are coming up. So uh, that is it. Your second question was uh, regarding... On a rolling stock. Oh, rolling so stock. How, how do you manage rolling? rolling stock in remote locations? Yes, yes, sorry. See, you now rolling stock is an interesting thing because uh, traditionally the way we were managing rolling stock was that we were running it, we had uh, um, periodic maintenance schedules. So how it works is that there is a maintenance facility for, uh, for locomotives. They have their maintenance sheds. 
and coaches also have uh, their homing sheds and they have a period after which they come back to that shed for maintenance and coaching stock they have this system of secondary and primary maintenance so they they move to to their destination there they have secondary maintenance then they come back and they have primary maintenance and then periodically they go to their maintenance facility for their periodic maintenance and then of course every few years they go for periodic overhaul now from that we want to move to a predictive maintenance regime so recently we have started to fix what we call this omrs which is actually a wayside uh, detection systems so what they do is that they they are they they, they have some sensors which capture some parameters of the trains as they go past and then they um, analyze those parameters and then raise alarms in case they find that there are some parameters that are going beyond the permitted levels permissible levels so that is in its early days right now but uh, that will be the real game changer because as far as information system is concerned because then there will be a lot of data coming in from these wayside locations and then a lot of analysis has to be done of that uh, data to be able to reach the right conclusions right now we will not dispense with our periodic maintenance but as this regime gets more and more streamlined stabilized and uh, reliable then slowly pro probably we can move to a predictive maintenance regime that is uh, that is the thought behind this whole thing Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. One uh, last question, Mr. Mataji. Uh, see the accidents. Uh, what is the latest technology you are planning to reduce accidents? Uh, two trains uh, coming in the same line, uh, signaling uh, is the issue, and uh, so many other things. Uh, so although that is not really in our purview, in Chris, because that is uh, pertaining to signals and that. i mean we are looking only at the control office uh, part but in any case they they railways now putting in place that tcas system uh, they have this uh, uh, tcas which uh, stands for uh, train control and uh, something system so, so i just forget the name but so what tcas does is that it enables uh, information to reach the driver in case trains are likely to be on the same track so it takes care of collisions whether rear end or or head on also allows it has some provisions that if there is a derailment on one of the rail uh, one of the lines then on the adjacent line you get a warning so that tcas is uh, one of the and uh, of course we also have gps devices on our uh, locomotives now but gps devices uh, they are not built for safety applications so i mean they don't have the reliability that is required for safety applications right now in the future perhaps they can also be used they can be leveraged so that track circuiting better signals this whole uh, thing has to be put in place to ensure that you reduce your accidents better control actually is is uh, the key to it actually but has to be Uh, into the future, uh, trains also will become smarter by themselves. Uh, yes, in fact, I, I didn't mention it, but there is also a smart coach that we have uh, recently, a couple of years back, we have come up, we have developed that smart coach. So the idea of the smart coach is that apart from onboard diagnostics, there are also communication systems for, with the external world. So smart coach, and I foresee that once five G comes in, perhaps it will be a game changer for us. Easy. Okay. Yes, because community actually, you know, the problem has been so far has been that what works in a static situation in a running train it doesn't work very well. So communication doesn't work very well. The cellular communication doesn't work very well in running trains unless it's voice. But uh, data, there are so much the fading and this and that. There are so many issues. But uh, technology increasing, bandwidth increasing, that that has uh, improved situations right now. But you use the fiber optic lines, right? Uh, going along with the track, rather than over. Yes. yes, fiber optic. We have five. Fortunately, we have fiber optic running across all our. I mean, alongside the railway lines. So we use that. We have tapped them at the major stations, and then I mean, we have tapped them, and then from that tapping, 
we can uh, either run fiber or run copper and use that as a communication medium. So we do that. Plus we also use it for backhaul. So, so with 5G, how, what is the approach? Um, right now, uh, wait and watch. <laughs> right now. Uh, no, I, I mean, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, policy right now that uh, I know. But I, I feel, I, I have a feeling that once it comes in, it will definitely be a game changer. I hope it will be. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Uh, you, uh, one minute. Very, very insightful. May, may, I, may I quickly ask a quick right. question? Okay. okay, please. This is Gopal here. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I shared my experiences earlier on in 1988. Did right. one beginnings of the freight management. Okay. And I was fortunate to work with Mr. Sampat, the then railway board member. Okay. He was mooting an idea that we should train people all along, all over the country on part-time basis in databases, only db 3 plus was there, so mm -hmm. that they can spend some time, 10 rupee per uh, record or 50 rupees per half a day mm -hmm. and make the manual data entry possible. Touched upon mm -hmm. a very important point. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very important because you have rightly said that the train on the move is different. Mm -hmm. Static train is different. Right. So with the spate of accidents, near misses that we are seeing these days, do you think mm -hmm. we should go back to that method, teach them Oracle and give them 10 rupee per hour so that they are also having a manual backup right through the track everywhere, in every village, every station? I think now maybe that you will not uh, require because automatic uh, collection of data is what is now feasible. Actually, at that time, it was not very feasible. At that time, actually, telecom was not uh, really developed in the country. Now, with better telecom, you should be able to, uh, and better sensors and uh, IoT in place, you should be able to uh, use automatic collection of data because uh, when we started looking at the data, we realized that uh, if you collect data very close to the source, when you collect data close to the source and in as automated a method as possible, uh, and you ensure that uh, the data as it travels through its life cycle, it is uh, scrutinized as it travels, then you will uh, end up with uh, the quality of data that you need to actually do an analysis. That is uh, one place where we are finding it difficult because right now, if the quality of data, suppose data is in the, insufficient or it is incorrect or it is part of a transaction that has not reached its logical conclusion and it is essentially abandoned. So those are, uh, areas, those, those are sources of inaccuracy in the data. So manually, whether you can now enter so much data, whether you can put the people in place, I don't know. I go by your but one, huh, but one interesting thing that you have said and which is very important is that what we realized was that just by educating uh, our users in basic information systems, we found that we were they were able to appreciate information systems better, and therefore the acceptability of those information systems went up. Wherever we did this, for example, in one of our manufacturing units, we did it. Wherever we educated our users, we sent them on uh, courses you know, on IT, not necessarily just the use of that technology, but even the underlying technology, some idea of databases, some idea of operating systems, some idea of data storage. We found that they responded much better. And they became allies in the implementation of those systems. You know, IT systems so strange, the same system, depending on how the user looks at it, can be successful or it can be unsuccessful. The same thing, same system. In one place, it's successful because you have a champion, you have positive people there. The same system is a failure in another location just because of the attitude of the people or because some interpersonal issues or because they feel that they are getting out of control. You know, so you run into these uh, interesting insights <laughs> when you start the implementation. But the, the, what you are saying, the idea that yes, your users, you should educate so that 
they uh, they appreciate the information systems that are being implemented there that is very well taken and that is essential i mean that that is very very important types maybe it's something that we are neglecting right now thank you ji for uh, staying patiently and answering all our questions i know uh, we have slightly taken more of your time but uh, thanks very much we truly appreciate uh, your participation as well as contributions to spin chennai as part of the spin dtm initiative and uh, thanks to all the participants uh, you know who've been uh, also patiently uh, you know staying back and uh, uh, raising all the questions relevant questions what has been troubling them in their mind uh, to get to know about railways very good thanks a lot once again uh, thank you very much thank it was a pleasure looking forward in, uh, to meeting you all in another session of spin chennai thank you